Hi everyone, thanks for watching. My name is Carly Wagner. I'm a graduate student at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and I study conservation sciences there. My thesis research is on starry stonewort, why you're here watching today. And today I'm going to be talking to you about my graduate research and sharing with you the results that I found on how starry stonewort impacts native plant communities in our lakes and how it spreads over time. So I'd like to thank the Coronas Lake Associations for, for having me for this talk um, and getting this research out to the public. So the title of my talk is Starry Stonewort Invasion in Minnesota Lakes and I'm going to be focusing on its spread and plant community impacts. So let's get into it. So introducing the star of the talk, Starry Stonewort, if you're watching this, I'm sure you know a little bit about this problematic invader, but I think the three main things you need to know is that it's a green macroalga, so it's not a plant, it's a macroalga, the only invasive macroalga we have in Minnesota. It grows via bulbils, you can see in the middle photo, these star-shaped reproductive structures it uses to grow and spread, and it's also its most identifying characteristic, so if you see a star shape bulbul like this in the middle photo you know you have starry stonewort and then the reason we're all concerned about starry stonewort is that it can form very dense mats as you can see in the right photo um, not a lot of area for other plants to grow so starry stonewort in Minnesota, it's a relatively new invader. We've only known of it in the state since 2015. It was first recorded in Coronas, as many of you probably know. Um, and today in 2019, it's present in 14 lakes across six counties. And it seems like every year there's new invasions identified. So right now, compared to our no other aquatic invasive plants, it has a relatively small distribution, only 14 lakes across six counties at the moment, but it is growing in presence and people are concerned about it there's new occurrences it seems like every year um, it's growing in lakes where it is established so it's a growing problem agencies members of the public lake associations are very concerned about it but what are the consequences what do we know about this invasive species For starry stonewort, we know for sure that it has recreational impacts, as you can see in the photo, and I'm sure many of you have experienced it, maybe along your lakeshore property. It grows very dense near to the surface, it's hard to boat through, um, fish in, so it definitely has recreational impacts. But on the flip side of that coin, invasive species can also have ecological impacts or impacts to you know, organisms like native plants, fish, or other species that are living in the lake. So we're concerned about ecological impacts for invasive species as well. And for starry stonewort, this is a really big unknown, um, which is worrisome because we don't know what it's doing in our lakes once it gets there. We're not quite sure if starry stonewort is going to cohabitate with native plants well. Like you see in the left photo, you can see there's starry stonewort on the bottom there, but there's some still native milfoils coming out of that, some different plant species. You can see other organisms still using that habitat like fish. So we don't know if it's going to be that type of state or like shown in the right photo where starry stonewort is a very dense mat. You don't see any other plants there. There's not a lot of the water column for other organisms to use. Um, so we really need to figure out where starry stonewort is going to be on this spectrum because if it's very high impact species, we need to um, have a lot of management and attention on it. Um, Vice versa, if it's cohabitating with native plants a lot, we can incorporate that into our native um, management strategies as well. So this enters my research, trying to answer this unknown question of what are the impacts of starry stonewort. The objectives of my research were to assess the impact of starry stonewort on native aquatic plants, which is a big unknown. Um, and it's problematic because starry stonewort acts like a plant. It's probably going to impact native plants um, if it's coming in and taking up that space. The second objective of my research was to quantify how starry stonewort invasion progresses over time. So once it's in a lake, what is it doing? How quick does it expand? Does it displace native species? And how much does it change native habitat? So these are my two objectives that I use to hopefully 
fulfill these goals of reducing the uncertainty on the threat of starry stone war. There's a lot of uncertainty on what's the fate of lake communities once starry stone war invades, and we know people are concerned about that. And these results also inform prioritization of species management. Given that starry stone war is a relatively new invader, there's a lot of resources and attention currently on it, and if we find that it is a very high impact species, then we know that that attention is warranted and we shouldn't look away. So for this research, I looked at starry stonewort in three invaded lakes in the state, Winnebagashish, Moose, and Coronis. Um, Coroni, Coronis is probably the lake that you're most interested in, and we'll have a lot of results from that lake. But I like that I use these three lakes because it's distributed throughout the state. There's different communities in each lake, so we can look at how broadly these trends are. You know, is it impacting in all lakes, or is it higher impact in some lakes more than others? So now I'm going to tell you how I did this research. How did I look at starry stonewort's impacts? And here's a video. What I did was set up transects or meter tapes along the bottom of a lake through vegetation, as you can see in the video, and the transects were set up from an area of high abundant starry stonewort to an area where there's a lot of natives. So then we'd sample along these transects to get an idea of what are the differences in native communities when starry stonewort is present in high abundance or when starry stonewort isn't there. You know, is there more species when starry stonewort isn't present? Is there more biomass of native species when starry stonewort isn't present? So by setting up these transects and sampling along them, we can look at how starry stonewort impacts native species. And of course, these transects are underwater, so we're using scuba diving to do that, um, or snorkeling. So you can see in this photo, you see a white PVC quadrat. It's just a square meter PVC frame that's laid along the transect and then in that quadrat we record what species are present and we estimate how much of those species are there and we do this using a percent cover um, assignment so you can see there's a sampler in that photo right there she's recording what species are there and how much of those species are there Here's another shot of what these transects looked like and what the sampling unit is, the quadrat. You can see starry stonewort is covering most of the bottom of this quadrat. We'd give that an eight, or it's a 100% cover for starry stonewort. And then you're seeing maybe one sprig of a pond weed right to the left of the tape there. That'd get a one score. It's present in zero to 1% of the quadrat. So that gives you an idea of what data we're collecting to look at the impacts of starry stonewort. Using this data, I looked at how starry stonewort affected the richness or number of native species present and also the total cover, the abundance of native species present. And these two measures are really good at assessing the overall health of a native community. You know, how many species are there that can influence how resilient and healthy a community is and the total cover of native plants can influence how much services are provided to that habitat. I also looked at impacts to species and groups of species. But I'm going to be presenting on the richness and total cover results because I think those are the most general important findings to get across. So I'm going to start by telling you about the impacts to native diversity. So here we have a graph. On the x-axis we have starry stonewort cover or nitalopsis cover. It's from zero to eight. Like I mentioned, we're estimating the cover of these species using a number assignment system. So zero is absent, and then eight is 100%. So if you can just think on the left-hand side with zero, there's no starry stonewort. Over on the right at eight, starry stonewort's covering the whole quadrat. On the y-axis, we have the richness of native species. So in a quadrat, how many species did we find? And that's just a simple count. The gray dots here are the actual observations. And then you can see I basically fit a line of best fit through that to figure out what is the trend as starry stonework gets more abundant, what happens to native richness. And what I found is that on average, when you go from no starry stonework to a lot of starry stonework, you lose about one and a half species. 
That might not seem like a lot, but remember these data points are collected at a square meter scale. It's a very small area. And if you're losing one to one and a half species in that small area, think about how that extrapolates to the full coverage of starry stonewort in a lake. So it's important to keep that in mind. And then for watchers here, what's most important to you guys is the coronis line, as you can see shown in pink, the line on the bottom. Coronis already has relatively low diversity compared to other lakes that I sampled. So if you're losing um, a few species in this lake, it could make a big difference. Now moving on to how starry stonewort affected the cover, the abundance of native species. Again, on the x-axis, we have starry stonewort cover, the same 0 to 100%. Now on the y-axis we have native cover, so this is also read as 0 to 100 percent. You can see it's a very sharp decline for this uh, relationship. As starry stonewort increases, you lose almost all native cover up to about you know, 1 to 5 percent is the average we saw. When starry stonewort is at 100 percent cover, you're not going to have barely any native cover remaining. And if you're having a hard time visualizing, well, what's going from a eight native cover to a zero native cover? Now I've showed kind of pictorials of what that might look like. So in the top left, we have an eight native cover score. You can see there's all sorts of different species. They're coming up at different heights. Um, it looks like a nice, rich community. Now when you go to the bottom right, that's going to be an eight starry stonewort score with about a zero or maybe a one native score. So you can see, I hope these pictures help you visualize what this relationship really looks like. So I collected all this data and I showed you these graphs to try and answer the question, does starry stonewort play well with native plants? And from these findings, our observations point to no. However, these data were collected um, in one season. We looked at starry stonewort in these lakes over about a one week period doing a lot of intensive sampling, but we're not sure um, how these trends will play out over time. And is starry stonewort displacing native species or is it just colonizing habitat where there's already low diversity? So to try and tease apart this question of does starry stonewort displace native species or just colonize poor quality habitat, I wanted to move into the second objective of quantifying how starry stonewort invasion progresses over time. And instead of doing a bunch of broad sampling at one point in time, this involves targeted sampling and revisiting of the same sites over multi-year periods to see how starry stonewort progresses and what is the fate of the native community as a result. So for this objective, we're using the same approach where we're having transects on the lake bottom and then sampling quadrats to record vegetation data along those transects. But for these transects, we have them permanently marked in the lakes with stakes that are pounded into the lake bottom to where we can revisit the exact same transect over a year. So in Coronis we have these long-term monitoring sites, we have 15 of them, where we can track starry stonewort's invasion over time. And these are really valuable data because you don't always get to watch an invasion play out over time and see exactly what an invasive species is doing to that community. So these long-term monitoring sites are really valuable and we're happy to have them in Coronas and also another lake, but I'm going to be presenting you the results on the Coronas project for this method. So what data did we collect and how am I going to show it to you? So we're sampling along those transects, we're figuring out what native species are present, how much of those native species, and then how much starry stonewort. So we visited these sites over multi-year period and this is how I'm going to show you the results. 
So for the x-axis, think of it as meter points along the transect. This graph is showing you a single transect that we have permanently marked in Coronis. Think of the first tick mark as the first meter, second tick mark as the second meter, and so on. It's a progression along that transect. And then on the y-axis, I'm going to show you how much native species are there, or the richness, and then how much starry stonewort is there. Starry stonewort is indicated by red, and the richness is indicated by blue. And what I want to show you with these data is how starry stonewort progresses over time and what happens to the native communities. And here you're going to now see the year-to-year -year data. Now this graph is moving. You can see on the top of the graph you have the year indicated. It starts at year one, then at year two, and then moves on to year three. So you're able to see on these transects that started out with only 50% of starry stonewort, remember they're set up to be half invaded and half uninvaded, what happens the next year when we go out to sample? How much has starry stonewort increased? And what native species are we maybe missing now that starry stonewort has increased? And then we were able to sample a third year as well. So you're seeing a three year data set on how starry stonewort is progressing in Coronis and what's happening to native species. And all these graphs are from Coronis. So this is what starry stonewort is doing in this lake, what we're seeing is really strong increases in abundance. And as a result, we're seeing native species become absent. This is proof that starry stonewort is displacing native species and not just colonizing um, low diversity habitat. So I'll just let you sit there and look at these graphs for a second or two to try and take it in. And again, if you're trying to visualize, well, what are these moving bar graphs depicting? Here's the video of this transect again. Picture on the first half, you're seeing starry stonewort, and then you move into a really rich native habitat. But then in year two, that starry stonewort is now covering more of the transect and more, and you're not seeing those native species to where in Coronis, now what we see is the beginning of that video, just blanket starry stonewort across all the transects. Um, and that was for all the transects we sampled in Coronis. It went from having native species, a good amount of starry stonewort, um, but it was kind of contained. And then as the years progressed, starry stonewort just blanketed those entire transects. And these transects are 25 meters, if you're curious about the scale of how starry stonewort is moving. So we see it moving you know, across 25 meter transects easily in a year. And we were really surprised that starry stonewort moved so quickly. When we place these long-term transects, we thought, well, we're going to have to monitor them for several years or not visit and go revisit. When we revisited them the second year, we saw how much it had already increased. And then that was a really surprising result. So we were really glad we were able to capture that spread and see how it's changing over time. So now that you've seen this data on how starry stonewort interacts with native species and how it kind of grows very aggressively and quickly, what are the takeaways of this research? Well, first, now we know for sure that starry stonewort has a high capacity to impact native plants and alter the overall community as a result. What you can expect is that there will be significant declines in native cover and also losses of a few species as starry stonewort increases. So the big um, key points that we're worried about in native communities generally are how many species are present and how much of those species are present. And starry stonewort negatively affects both of those attributes. And then from this resample data that I showed in the moving graphs, we show that starry stonewort definitely displaces native species and can grow and expand rapidly. And impacts are likely to become widespread in invaded lakes over time if starry stonewort continues to spread. 
So some takeaways of this work. First starry stonewort, early detection of new invasions is very important because if you can contain the infestation or um, manage it um, successfully, then you're not going to have spread year to year. You're going to hopefully contain those impacts to native plant communities. And then what these data show is that starry stonewort is a high impact invader and warrants prioritization. Um, we were really surprised at how much impact starry stonewort has on native plant communities. So the attention that management agencies, lake associations, um, and University of Minnesota Extension is giving this invader is definitely warranted. It's one that we hopefully could prevent from becoming widespread across the state, like Eurasian water milfoil or curly leaf pondweed. It's early on in its invasion history. It's not widespread across Minnesota. Um, and showing these results, we don't want it to be. So hopefully we can prevent that. Some acknowledgments. I'd like to acknowledge all the help I received for this research. I was funded through the GLRI and Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And then I'd like to thank my whole lab group and advisor at the University of Minnesota, as well as the AIS detectors that helped me do some of this sampling um, out on Coronas. And then I'd like to give a special thanks to Bug Beehive Resort that provided lodging for us to sample out on Coronas. Um, and we've really appreciated how accessible it is to do research on Coronas, and it's coming out um, with a lot of good data on starry stonewort. You know, we're starting to answer these questions that we didn't have answers to in 2015 when it all of a sudden showed up. So I hope this um, little presentation helped you learn something about starry stonewort that you didn't know, and thanks for watching.